Hi guys, and thank you for tuning in. It is quite easy to discuss chemical breakdown of alcohol when you are in the nice, warm and cozy classroom. So instead of doing that, I'm going to take you to the point where things are getting a bit more complicated and you need to deal with your pissed patient in the uh, cold and wet ditch. Sounds like fun, shall we? My name is Alex Hepner and this is Group Call. One thing you have to remember whilst attending intoxicated patients in Catham is that ethanol impairs coagulation so badly that a clot formation time will take 118% longer than in sober patients with similar injuries. Please see this study. So have a bit more than a one cat hem pack in hand because this will be a bit more challenging job than you can expect. Alcohol or ethanol, if you like, impairs the different parts of the body, including the brain. Particularly, cerebellum which plays an important role in motor control and muscle tension. Hence why, in acutely intoxicated patients, you may expect problems judging distances, inability to walk, and most importantly, decreased muscle tone. Why most importantly? Because if you look at the um, airway opening, you will notice that it's full of muscles, with the tongue being the biggest one. Initially, when the alcohol levels in the bloodstream are relatively low, uh, cerebellum will maintain some muscle tension. So the speech of your patient will be just slurred. As a tongue won't be able to work properly. It's a muscle, right? <laughs> Later on, the alcohol levels are going up, the cerebellum is not able to maintain the muscle tension and you're losing the airway. <laughs> Takeaway point, be ready for losing an airway in intoxicated patients. Now, to maintain the airway in intoxicated patients, I would recommend NPA rather than OPA. NPAs are far better tolerated by intoxicated patients and don't cause a gag reflex. Also, please don't worry if your patient sustained trauma to the head, even a basal skull fracture. It is not longer a contraindication for NPA, it is a caution. How would, how would you like to do it? You want to put the loop on the whole uh, device. Please do not put the loop on the tip of the device. Now, bevel towards the septum. Gently press the tip of your nose. Start with the right nostril, which is physiologically bigger, and gently wiggle it all the way down. And that's your NPA in. Now, I know that in some countries, IV antiemetics are administered to intoxicated patients, but this purely matter of waiting risk versus benefits as alcohol can increase the nervous system side effects of antiemetics like ondansetron or metoclopramide. Now when you have your basic airway in place, let's cover your patient up with the blanket to protect them from hypothermia and take them to the back of the, your truck to treat B, C and D. What if you need to upgrade your airway? Hmm, well, Agile seems to be a good idea, but as much as I love Agile for its simplicity, they are contraindicated in any condition where a patient may have a full stomach. And I'm pretty sure he had at least one kebab. Are we doomed? Not if you have a nasogastric tube, you can shuffle down the gastric channel. How to do it? Just simply measure the nasogastric tube from patient's nostril to the belly button and in the cleanest possible way, feed it through the gastric channel of an eye gel. This should help you to decompress all the gases that collected in the patient's stomach and prevent vomiting and regurgitation if you need to bag your patient. Intubation, ladies and gentlemen, is a completely different story. So firstly, ask yourself if your patient actually needs a tube. As you know from my previous videos, I'm a big fan of intubation, but I don't think that we should tube every single patient. Also remember that fiddling around the valecular space with the tip of the laryngoscope can trigger the gag reflex and only make the things worse. On the other hand, a number of studies, with this being uh, the most recent one, confirm that the intoxicated patients, especially with a severe head injury, will require intubation in field or on a &E, more likely than sober patients with similar injuries. Is there an alternative then? Yes, there is. VSCOPE, a true game changer in terms of intubation. 
it allows you to intubate without getting into the valecular space and you can easily get an amazing view with almost no effort at all. Also, because it's construction, it allows you to perform the paraglossial intubation, so from the far lateral aspect of the mouth, avoiding the bulk of the tongue. The procedure you would never ever perform using the classical laryngoscope. What is also important, because of the minimal head movement required to use the V-scope, you can easily use it if the patient is having a C collar on. But I will discuss color a bit later in this video, so say, stay tuned. What I'm going to do now is demonstrate an intubation with classical laryngoscope. Please pay attention to the range of head movement I need to perform in order to use a good view. Good view. Yep, that's my view. And now using VSCOPE. Firstly, classical intubation. That's my view. Did you notice that I did not move the head? I almost did not move the head. I just opened the airway. Now, the paraglossial intubation, so for the lateral aspect of the mouth. Again, I'm not even touching the head. And that's my view. It's amazing. Okay, I'm going to show one more trick. This is the situation in the cold, dark ditch where your VSCOPE is one and only uh, source of light. Um, I'm going to perform a paraglossial intubation. So from the lateral aspect of the mouth, I'm inserting my device here. As you can see, not creating any pressure on the teeth, uh, just from the lateral aspect of the mouth. And now please see my view. I hope you can see it as clearly as I can. This is the glottic opening. How cool is that? Okay, so you've seen the view, now uh, the whole procedure. So I will open the patient's mouth, I slide the VSCOBE in, I've got my view, now what I need to do is just insert the bougie in. I can see that the bougie is passing the vocal cords, I remove the device holding the bougie in place and now all I need to do is just feed the tube down the bougie. Bougie out, tube is in situ, required depth. If I want to, I can still confirm my tube placement getting the view from VSCOPE. And of course, auscultation and ETCO2. Speaking of the intubation of your intoxicated patient, if your patient had a beer or any fizzy drink, please remember that the gas from the fluid can cheat an ETCO2 sensor and you actually can see ETCO2, even a good reading and a good waveform, if you intubated the stomach. Let me show you a trick. This is your patient's stomach and I will ventilate empty stomach and as you can see on the ETCO2 it is zero which is okay because there is no ETCO2 in the stomach now let me open the beer let's open two now let's intubate the stomach tube goes in pay attention to what happens with ETCO2 4.3 And this experiment takes us nicely to the next point, which is breathing. As described in this study, in acute alcohol intoxication you may expect slower respiratory rate, respiratory depression, or even respiratory arrest. However, in monitoring, please be very careful and very observant. Don't solely rely on SpO2. Why? Because your patient may have cold fingertips, either from holding a cold beer or being outside for a quite long time. Also, there's a significant over 30 seconds delay between what you 
see on the SATS monitor and what is actually happening. So your patient may stop breathing and you will see good SATS for next 30, 40 seconds on the monitor. So keep an eye on your patient. Circulatory system response to acute alcohol intoxication is super in-depth topic, but I will do it my best to make it easy to consume and focus on the most important factors. Symptoms may vary from person to person. However, as nicely pointed out in this study. Let me see. Um, acutely intoxicated patients will develop lower average stroke volume, lower blood pressure and pulse variability and increased vascular tone baroreflex sensitivity. In plain English, alcohol takes away compensatory mechanisms from the circulatory system. So your patient's body response to infection or shock may be very subtle. Think about it before you will discharge someone at scene. Most common tachyarrhythmus will be AF, also known as holiday heart syndrome, or even tossade de poil. From blood arrhythmus point of view, you may see sinus bradi with recurrent syncope. Other ECG changes you may observe is P wave prolongation, QT prolongation, and T wave abnormalities. We're not really sure what causes those changes. Most likely, electrolyte imbalance caused by alcohol. Now, acute alcohol intoxication causes several metabolic abnormalities, including hypoglycemia, lactic acidosis, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, and hypophosphatemia. Uh, so make sure you check your patient's BM before you will make your final diagnosis. Now the last bit, because it's very controversial. So should we immobilize intoxicated patients or not really? Now, let me check. So um, the 10th edition of ATLS guidelines uh, states that the triple immobilization should be initiated in patients with low GCS or evidence of alcohol and drug intoxication. The HTLS, it's not that black and white. Uh, you can cisplain immobilize in case of altered mental status or inability to communi communicate effectively. Com communi I'm not a big fan of immobilization. However, if you want to immobilize, think about problems with color so like occlusion to jugulars and raised intracranial pressure and difficulty in accessing the airway. So if you want to immobilize, maybe it's worth considering a different device than a ordinary color aspen type. This is the Lubo collar. Those orange sections should come under the patient's jawline and then this bit goes on the chin. Rest of it, classically around the neck. Let's see how it works in practice. Okay, so this is the Lubo collar behind the patient's head. Those uh, orange sections here uh, should go where the angle of the jaw is. And please remember to do it properly, to adjust them properly, because otherwise it would be counterproductive. Then the chin strap goes on the chin and hooks on the second part of the collar. Here you go. Now, rest of the collar, those sections are put almost like classic collar. And now just adjust chin strap. All done. Now here, from this perspective, you can see that actually those orange elements are providing almost like a jaw thrust. And definitely there is no compression to the jugulars. I can put my finger here and actually palpate jugulars. Also, let's try now uh, anterior posterior movement. It's really limited. Now lateral movement. Yeah, there is still some lateral movement, but that's the nature of the beast. That's, that's the nature of every single splinting system or collars. And to me, this collar is a game changer, a next game changer next to VS Scope um, shown today. And that's it guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and smack like button. It will really help this channel to develop. Now, big thank you to David Halliwell from uh, Lifecast Body Simulation and Jake Rachman from Simulation Man for helping me out uh, with this episode. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.